It's Christmas time. Bum, bum. Dum, dum. La, la, la. I don't know the rest of the words. I was trying to start off with a Christmas song, but. <laughs> and in our world. Yeah, what is that? Oh, do they know it's Christmas? Do they know, know you know it's all these Christmas fucking obscure time. Christmas songs and shit? They're not obscure. Oh, you just, they're obscure. You just did not have. Dude, I've, I've been working retail practically my whole life. Never once have I heard any of these fucking Christmas songs. And, why, and the reason why I'm saying that is because retail... On it, the like worst After Christmas fucking song. Thanksgiving, or actually after October, is when they start playing Christmas music. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, they're fucking obscure. Like, I know mainstream Christmas music <laughs> as a result. I feel like you don't. No, definitely there's... Uh, the UK and Irish Christmas songs, ah, uh. so much better than the American ones. Mm. Um, God, you're such a hipster. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. They're the best. I literally grew up with them. It was nothing strange for us as children, or even now, growing up in my house, to come home in the middle of July or August, and to have Christmas music blaring while mom's upstairs cleaning the bathroom or something yeah your mom really loves christmas your whole family really loves christmas but i think like the the driving force of christmas joy is your mom definitely yeah she's definitely the beacon of yep. light big time okay creeps you're probably wondering wait a minute it's thursday what am i doing with these creeps in my ear but guess what? This is your fucking Christmas present. We've infiltrated ha, your ha, ears. Ha, ha, ha. We're doing you in the ear right now <laughs> with our voices. Yeah. Look at us going in and out of your ear. Stuff in your ear holes. Yeah. We're just packing that earwax into your ear with yeah. our voices. Just. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gross. <laughs> so. Rather than tell everybody the story of, you know, Krampus or whatever like that, um, we decided to do something a little different, a little different for us. Anyway, I don't know about other podcasts or whatever. We're bringing you, I'm going to call this, um, hold on, I had it earlier on. Oh, it's gone. I had like a, a really cool title for this episode. It's going to be like. Weekly creep, creepy pasta, crapapalooza, <laughs> or something like that. I had it earlier. How about on. how about slap your ham holidays? Slap your ham holidays. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We're 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 working on it. We're working on it. It's, it's a work in progress. But anyway, for those of you who don't know what creepy pasta is or creepy pastas are, they're just fictional stories that people have submitted to i guess creepypasta i thought it was just through reddit to be honest i had never actually looked up creepypastas before i thought it was just old spaghetti uh -huh. <laughs> no but i've never really i never figured out why they call it pasta like why not creepy meatloaf or something like that you know uh, yeah no i genuinely don't know i don't know where it came from again i thought it like started off years and years ago like before I had internet kind of thing. Mm. So I actually just looked up the definition on Wikipedia. Uh -huh. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it says, Creepypastas are horror-related legends that have been copied and pasted around the internet. Mm -hmm. These internet entries are often brief, user-generated paranormal stories intended to scare readers. They include gruesome tales of murder, suicide, and other worldly occurrences. According to Time magazine... The genre had its peak audience in 2010. Okay, but where does the pasta come in? I'll get back to that. But, like, the most famous creepypasta, or certainly the most famous one that I know, Slenderman. is Slenderman, yeah. <laughs> As if he's, like, um, Jewish or something. Uh, Slenderman. Rick Slenderman? Yeah, yeah. Slenderman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the term creepypasta is derived from the internet slang term copypasta, copy and pasted text creepy past that can be text only but some of the most famous stories were circulated with a cryptic image or video okay anyway so we're not here to regale you with the best of the best creepy pastas by no. any means 
we're here to make you laugh, make you think, entertain you while you're at, probably stuck at home doing nothing on Christmas Eve. What are you, you talking know? about? People are running around. They're busy. They're stuck in lines of traffic and queuing up and getting their last minute things and shit like that. I don't know what the what? fuck they're doing. But anyway, we're yeah. so this week we enlisted the help of our nieces, Mimi and Nana. Yeah. And they also picked out two of these stories. That's their nicknames before you fucking ask. They're just nicknames. Okay. I just accepted no. it. <laughs> I don't mean you, I know, but like I know, our I know. listeners. Okay, so who's going first? Do you want to go first? I'll go first. Um, so I've only I I skimmed my stories. I didn't want to read them completely mm -hmm. because I wanted to get surprised by myself too. <laughs> like I'm gonna surprise okay. myself, like when I laugh at my jokes, but this time I want to scare myself. So this one, Mimi picked it out. This one's called Millie Muffin Top. Attacked. I feel attacked. Okay. I've always hated... <laughs> you just got it. <laughs> I've always hated Christmas. 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 Not as a holiday, don't get me wrong. It's just the stress of rushing around to pick up gifts on some of the most busiest days of the year. When my daughter Emily was seven years old, she was at the doll phase. My wife and I used to find it baffling how she was still into dolls and for good reason. She loved the little things. That Christmas, my wife was in a car accident. I wasn't myself that year. I refused to take time off work. My little girl needed comfort more than ever. I had to work up the money to give her the best gift I could afford. I realize now I should have invested time to her, not my job. My wife's parents were willing to look after her whilst I worked. While I worked. Why did they write whilst? I, they're really trying hard to be like yeah. authory. But from their cold stares, I could tell that they disapproved of my overtime. I went out to the biggest toy store in town. All the box toys lined on, lined up in rows on shelves, taunting myself and all the other eager parents outside the shop windows. I was near the end of the queue when the doors opened. And even after I finally got inside, most of the gifts had been snaffled up from the shelves. <laughs> snaffled. It's like, I can make my own words. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the shelves near the back of the shop. I walked over, seeing toys aimed at boys. Super soakers and action figures lined the shelves. Except for the far left were five boxes marked with Millie Muffin Top in bubble text across the front. I picked one up. There was no clear plastic, so I had no way of seeing the contents of the box. The name seemed to give the impression that the toys were a copy of the popular strawberry shortcake toys that my daughter liked. I waltzed over the counters, bought the doll, and went home. I knocked on the door of my in-law's house and was greeted by the dull expression of my late wife's mother. We exchanged small talk before I drove Emily back home. That night, while Emily was on the couch watching TV, I went into her room and opened the box to her toy so I could place it on her bed. I carefully opened the boxing. I don't know. Non-existent eyes greeted me. What? What? First of all, that's a weird way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Hollow sockets where the eyes would have been. I expected the doll. I inspected. I think he wrote. I inspected. <laughs> that's what I feel like I'm doing with my mouth. I inspected the doll further. And I soon realized that the eyes were not the worst part about the doll. By far. Whoa. Okay. Beneath the clothing lay a bed of slowly decomposing flesh, accompanied by an odor I could barely stomach. The doll was made from the skin of what seemed to be a small child. 
Crude stitching laced the sides of the doll. I threw the doll across the room. It hit the floor with a thud, much heavier than I would have expected. I came to a horrifying conclusion. There was something inside the doll. Mm, okay. Weird, I would have thought he would have felt the weight while he was inspecting the doll before he threw it. But whatever. <laughs> I ran downstairs to get a knife. Not because of some child's play shit or anything like that, but to cut the thing open. My curiosity had gotten the better of me, and I needed to see the doll's contents. Daddy, what's wrong? Oh, God. Inquired my daughter in a worried tone. Nothing, sweetie. Just stay down here and watch the TV, okay? I grabbed the knife and crept back up the staircase. As I opened the door to Emily's room, the doll lay where I had left it. Thank God. I shoved the knife into the side of the doll and pulled downwards, ripping open the side of the doll. I pulled out a small box, the size of a squeaker. I shook it, hearing multiple things moving around inside there. I did found... You, I'm sorry, did you say the size of a squeaker? Yeah. What the fuck is a squeaker? I think it's those things that they put in toys to make them squeak. Okay, okay. How okay, fine. That's fine. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna take a shot keep in going. the dark. Just keep going. Shot in the dark and say it's a squeaker. Okay. Um I I found an opening and I widened it with my knife. I sat there frozen. Inside was a picture of a baby. If I had to guess, I would say she was around four months old. She lay limp on a messy floor. I clasped my hand to my mouth, seeing the red pool around the child. I removed the picture and vomited into my hands. Oh, God. Upon seeing the proof that this was not some sick joke. Two small eyeballs. They sat above the final item from the box. Some form of receipt lay under the eyes. I soon realized it was a kind of note that usually came with these kinds of dolls. It read the following. Hi, I'm Millie Muffintop. Thank you for adopting me as your new little baby girl. I promise to be the best sister ever. That's, that's it? That's it. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that's, that's interesting. If you had to rate that from... Well, I guess I've got nothing to compare from. I was going to say 1 to 10, but... It says MM Season 1, number 43. So I don't... I don't think there's a way to... To see who wrote this. Yeah. So there was baby's eyes in the box. Real eyes. Yeah, so the baby... The, I was going <laughs> to say to the... Clear this up. <laughs> the eyes that were missing from the doll were inside the body. That got dark real quick. Yeah, with the picture of the... The dead baby. The dead baby that the skin came from. Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Thanks, Mimi! <laughs> yeah, Jesus, That was Mimi. twisted. Wow. <laughs> I'm kind of proud. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I'm not going to lie. I did try and look up Santa Claus Erotica <laughs> because I thought it would be really funny. And I just assumed that somebody out there with the same sense of humor as me would have written plenty of Santa Claus erotica. I got two stories in and realized that people have a real thing for Santa Claus. Yeah. It was not funny. I can see that. It was just just straight up erotica. Kind of want you to Santa wear Claus. Santa Claus. Oh, well, okay. I have the right physique for it at this stage. <laughs> anyway, so I quickly backed out of that. Don't look at my browser history. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the three that i've or this is one of the three that i've picked it's called wait is this erotica no oh no the erotica was too erotic I for me i was <laughs> like this this is a family show <laughs> <laughs> okay this one's called hello all right adele go ahead yeah the doorbell rings and you get up from where you sat staring stonily into space. Alliteration. Yeah. Nice. 
You already know who is at your door and why he is there. You open it, nodding numbly to the man. You make a note in your head that the man looks... Sneaky. But you assume that must be because he's a lawyer. Because... Okay. Alright. Uh, you show him into your living room, dreading what is to come. The man hands you a CD he produces from his briefcase and sets what looks like a birdcage on your coffee table. You cannot see what is inside the cage as it is covered in a blanket of embroidered silk. The man sits as you put the disc into your stereo and press play. You hear the sound of stressed breathing from the speakers as you take your seat. The lawyer hasn't said a word, but you know the breathing to be that of your late friend. The last breathes of your friend. Breaths? It says breathes. I'm reading it as is. Oh, what? You can hear something in the background, behind your friend's heavy breathes, as if someone or something was scratching at the door. You wonder if you're hearing things, as the sound is barely audible in the recording. You look up as you hear her voice, as if she was in the room with you, as if she was alive. Full of breathes. <laughs> <laughs> Full of breathes. <laughs> okay, so now I'm the friend, okay? I'm, I'm her. This is my lady's voice. Okay. The date is September the 1st. That's your uh, lady's voice? She's dying. Oh, but still... The date is September the 1st of 2008. Her voice is shaky. Every word she speaks is saturated with fear. This is my last will and testament. Now I don't have much time. They're almost here. So I'll dispense the formalities and get on with what I have to say. A dying person doesn't talk like that. Seriously, this is her dispensing the formalities. <laughs> this is the last day of my life, as you probably already figured out. <laughs> God, this is awful this began with the death of my uncle I had never known him very well only a few times at family reunions and Christmas parties but he had left me something on his will I sat awkwardly reading oh no this is still her I sat awkwardly through the reading of the document until at last my name was called I collected a small box of knickknacks and a covered cage on the cage, there was a note saying, Please do not unveil the surprise until you are home. So I hurried home without taking the silk blanket off the cage. What was inside the box is of no consequence, so I don't know why I told you this. But underneath... <laughs> it <doesn't... laughs> okay. What was inside the box is of no consequence, but underneath the blanket... I warn you, do not take the blanket off until this recording has ended. There's an old bird cage. Inside of the birdcage is a parrot. Is <laughs> a parrot. <laughs> Inside of this birdcage is a bird. <laughs> I was indeed surprised, but there were more shocks to come. When I lifted the blanket, the bird's eyes were immediately fixed on me. Oh. Its beady eyes shone wickedly upon seeing a new face, and it said plainly in a squawky voice, Hello. That's my squawky voice. I don't know what I... Anyway. It's so meta. It's like the old lady first, like, make, like impersonating a scary parrot. Yeah, oh, she's not old. <laughs> this is, I'm assuming this is a young a girl. A dying person. A dying person. Can't you tell by the distress in my uh, voice? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stared back at it and it repeated itself. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I dismissed it as a cute trick my uncle had taught it. I was very wrong. The next day when I took the blanket off the cage. I'm assuming that she just left. Was like, okay, I'm going to put this blanket back on and leave the bird forever. <laughs> I was not greeted with a hello. No, on the second day the bird didn't talk at all. What it did do was breathe loudly, as if it was hyperventilating, or at least copying someone who was terrified. On the third day, the bird did not speak, but made the sound of a grown man crying. What? Ah! That's what I'm assuming the bird sounded what? like. I was very disturbed and covered the cage for the remainder of the day. <laughs> the fourth day. I don't know what, actually, 
what this has to do with Christmas? It's probably the 12 days of Christmas with, like, the scary-ass bird. There's not 12 days. Anyway, oh. okay, uh, th there's my first fuck-up, anyway. This is just a regular creepypasta. Uh, it was in the Christmas section. Anyway. Uh, well, now you gotta finish uh, it. Yeah, I'm looking. I lost my place. The fourth day, in a voice not unlike my recently departed uncle's, the bird cried, Oh God. Oh God. I thought the bird had learned it from listening to the television, and I resolved to never let it hear the television again. I didn't turn O-N, the TV, all that day. But on the fifth day, when I uncovered the cage, the bird screamed. Ah! What the fuck? Not a normal scream, mind you. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Iron Maiden. <laughs> And it was nothing I had ever had turned on the television. It was the sound of a man screaming in terror and pain. It was, I know now, the scream my uncle gave when he was killed. When the bird screams again, it will be my scream as they tear me apart. For even now, the bird is listening to me. It stares at me coldly where I've barricaded myself in the kitchen. As you life depends on it, do not yet uncover the cage. The sixth day. Christ. <laughs> yesterday, in fact. <laughs> Fuck. When I hesitantly co uncovered the cage, the bird was quiet. Perhaps ten minutes later it cocked its head to the side as if it heard someone, as if it had heard something I could not. They're coming. It whispered, they're coming. The parrot? The parrot, yeah. This oh. is the par this is my parrot whisper. Hello? <laughs> That's my impersonation of the parrot. Over and over again, he repeated in a haunting voice. They're coming, they're coming, coming they're, they're coming, coming. coming. Today is the seventh day, and they are here. Fucking hell. Just as the bird said. I can hear them scratching at the door and crawling in the walls. The bird is waiting to record how I die. I swear, if it could grin... It would have been grinning from the moment I uncovered its cage. The noises are getting louder. They'll get in soon, so I'm going, so I'm saying goodbye now. Take care of the bird. I couldn't think of anyone else to give it to. I'm sorry. You must take care of him till they come for you. You have seven days. The track ended suddenly and you look around startled. You must have been entranced by the disc for the lawyer is gone. You hadn't noticed him leave. You stare at the uncovered cage on the coffee table and wonder if you had just heard if what oh no this is and wonder if you had just heard on the CD was real or just some elaborate hoax. A rustling comes from underneath the embroidered silk. Your curiosity begs you to see what's in the cage. You slowly raise up the blanket. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, that's by a poison logic. Let's just talk real quick, right? A few little pot plot holes. Why is she dying if they haven't got there yet? Yeah. If it's them that are coming to kill her. Also, what a shitty friend. By the way, you need to look after the bird. Here's seven days worth of bird feed. <laughs> and they're going to kill you at the end of it. <laughs> Seriously, keep the fucking bird. Let's get better friends. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry if you don't like uh, dumb voices. That was the worst You're creepy pasta I'd ever heard. Really? Yeah. Thanks. I put a lot of work into that. <laughs> All right. All right. Next. All right. So here we go. This one's called My Son heard santa on the roof but i don't think it was santa oh shit it was my dick <laughs> my... <laughs> it was the parrot hello <laughs> <laughs> i'm not santa <laughs> all right <laughs> the only redeeming quality yeah is hello. When, you, when you made fun of the parrot all right <laughs> My son heard something on the roof last night. Police lights cover our living room as I type this. 
Why are you typing this while the police is there? I actually skimmed through these yesterday. I thought the exact same thing. <laughs> Sir, we need to take a statement. Hold on, I'm writing a creepy buzz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm updating my Reddit. It was Christmas Eve, and we were all tucked into bed like we should have been. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. good. That was when I heard a pounding sound. <laughs> <laughs> I purposely stopped right there. Because <laughs> you knew I was going to laugh. <laughs> yeah. God, I'm a child. That was when I heard a pounding <laughs> <laughs> sound coming from the ceiling. My wife wrestled a bit in her sleep, but remained still. I on the... <laughs> That's funny as fuck. I, on the other hand, could not. He was doing the pounding. I was. All right. <laughs> I got up out of bed, and went to go check on my son. When I got to his bedroom, he wasn't there, which scared me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> He opened the door and was like, hello? <laughs> <laughs> For fuck's sake. If this episode doesn't lose us listeners, I swear to God. It's a miracle. <laughs> Don't worry. Only three and a half more stories to go. <laughs> I'm having a great time. Yeah, me too. All right. I rushed out of his room and looked over the stairs' balcony into the living room. There was my son. Standing in front of the chimney, next to all the presents my wife and I had wrapped just an hour ago. Wow, talk about last minute. Mm. I'm not, who am I to talk? I'm yeah. wrapping my shit tomorrow. <laughs> Great, I thought. It looked like we'd get no sleep before we'd have to open presents. I journeyed downstairs and made my way past the kitchen and into the living room. Hey, champ. I said in a groggy voice. What are you doing up so early? My son turned to me and said, I heard Santa Claus on the roof, and I wanted to come down and see him. I lifted a brow as I glanced at the presents he was steadily ignoring besides him. Beside him, I guess. <laughs> Looks like Santa brought you a lot of gifts this year. You must have been a good boy. Oh, presents as in gifts. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I heard presents as in ghost. Oh. <laughs> My son looked to the ground with a frown. Why the long face, bud? Santa says that you wrapped those gifts yourself. Oh, yeah. You've talked to Santa, have you? He looked back down at the floor. He told me not to tell you. This had me a little worried. I wonder if my wife had taken our son to a mall Santa and maybe he'd been drunk and spilled the beans about the magic of Christmas to our child. Don't listen to that Santa buddy. Those presents have Santa's name on them. Now how about we open gifts? I'll wake your mother up and as soon as I make her a cup of coffee, we'll open these bad boys, okay? He turned back to the chimney, and I went to go brew my wife a cup of coffee. As I brewed the coffee, I could hear my son whispering something to himself. Hey, bud, who are you talking to? He turned around and said, Santa. And he fell to his knees and collapsed onto his palms. I looked towards the chimney and saw a long, slim, black and gray striped sweater, arm, going down the chimney with a long fingered bony hand around my son's ankle. I dropped the mug of coffee to the ground and shattered it into pieces and took a few steps forward, but it was fruitless. The chimney absorbed my son, pulling him upward into it. His screams echoed off the bricks until the only thing I could hear was pounding on the ceiling. No, the rooftop. I ran outside, ignoring my wife's yells from upstairs, and quickly peered up at the roof where a tall, scrawny, old, bearded man stood. His eyes were sunken in, and the eyes themselves were pitch black. Antlers 
extended out from his forehead, stretching out toward the night sky. He had a bulging sack. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think whoever wrote this must have been very lonely. Aww. He had a bulging sack over his shoulder. It must have been my son squirming inside the bag for dear life. The bearded man looked over at me, put a finger to his lips, then leaped to my neighbor's rooftop, and then to the next until he was out of sight. My wife ran outside to me and asked where our son was. I told her to phone the police, which she did, and that brings us to where we are now. Police have questioned me repeatedly. At first, I gave them the true story of what happened. When they didn't buy it, I changed my story and they threw it up to me being shaken by what had happened. In the end, I told them there had been a robbery and my son had been kidnapped. What I told the police before, though, was that my boy had heard Santa on the rooftop. But I don't think it was Santa. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, no so, shit, it wasn't Santa. <laughs> so what? It wasn't a person either, though. It was some weird antler having fucking demon man that can jump from rooftop to rooftop. Yeah. That takes children away. If he had sack. a striped sweater, I'm guessing he might have been like a modernized Krampus. Ah. Uh, yeah. All right. That one wasn't the worst. No. That one was not bad at all. Definitely better than hello. Hello. Okay, so I don't know if this one has silly voices or not. Mm-hmm. So sorry if that we don't disappoints want it. you. <laughs> <laughs> I picked this one because it was kind of Stephen Kingish. Mm. Patrick Finn arrived home from his Christmas conquests, beating out the snowstorm by mere miles, mere minutes. He felt not only the foreboding presence of a hazardous blizzard, but also that of something else, something darker. It felt as if it resonated not only within his soul, but also within the souls of all of those around high. What? I think it's supposed to be... Him? Him. Mm. <laughs> but also within the souls of those around him. Within the very ground itself. <laughs> I told I just you. it in my head. It's like, are oh, the souls all around high? <laughs> I'm trying to read like, them as is. All right. Hey, <laughs> yeah. what's up? <laughs> Adam. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But also within the souls of those around him, within the very ground itself. Patrick had never bothered to check, but he was sure that beneath the grass and soil of Winter Harbor, Maine, therein hungered a gaping mouth or a chasm yearning for the flesh of the innocent, and anchored to the physical world only by a desire that to seem normal. It had not yet been appeased because the residents of Winter Harbor were all but innocent. Patrick had moved to Winter Harbor, hoping to escape the despondency and despair he had felt in his hometown, Belmont, Maine. So far these feelings had only amplified, magnified by both the wintry death that he felt tiptoeing in the town's midst and the lingering scent of paint that seemed to permeate every building in the city. It was as if the town was constantly being repainted in some sort of half-hearted attempt to cover something up. Still, he felt it necessary to stay, so as not to make matters worse for his wife, whom he barely saw anymore, and his son, who always seemed so distant. He and his wife were going through a rife time in their marriage, and their son was feeling its effects. It was akin to what one may feel after a tumultuous earthquake. Patrick felt that he had to make it up to his son, so he went out and bought him the most expensive and extravagant thing he could his hands on this late in the shopping season. A brand new video game system. <laughs> he had assured his son that even so, he <laughs> acted out of, okay, sorry. He had assured his son, even though he had acted out often this year, Santa would bring him something good. Throughout these charades, Patrick felt empty at the prospect of shipping for a boy that he knew nothing about, 
a boy whose existence was forgotten every so often. On the even of Christmas, that's, I, don't, I don't know what that is. I'm, anyway, on the even of Christmas, Patrick arrived home before the snowstorm and quickly crept into the garage to wrap the present and place it under the tree. It was in this garage that he often felt abrupt changes, as if within its small space it contained secrets beyond human comprehension. The musky smell of the old holiday decorations coupled with the omnipresent scent of fresh paint, varnish and gasoline all seemed to meld into one personified force, whispering sweet nothings to Patrick as he exited his car. This caused him to shudder heavily, as if beset by a fit of delirium tremens. He shrugged off the dull headache and dry mouth before quickly and sloppily wrapping the gift. Following this, he slipped it under the tree and began to creep upstairs. He couldn't help but grimace at the thought that he was as far from Santa as humanly possible. As he reached the top of the landing, Patrick glanced over at the clock. It read 11.49. He stood there, as if to wait for some fleeting childhood feeling that may accompany the arrival of Christmas. Christmas is still 11 minutes away. 11 minutes is a long time to stand there and wait for fucking <laughs> some childhood feeling to come over him. It did not come, as he soon found. Nor did cheery music nor the scent of evergreens and cookies. Just deafening silence and that damnable scent of paint. It was everywhere. He couldn't escape it. The arrival of yet another disappointing Christmas struck Patrick like a blow to the face. He fell to his knees, then subsequently onto his stomach. He couldn't tell if he had passed out or not. Suddenly, a loud sound in his son's room jarred Patrick awake. He quickly got up and stumbled into the room. The popping sound he had heard made him wonder what made it, and when he finally found out, he was confused even further. A large, black humanoid, adorned with goat horns and a tongue that writhed like a snake, stood before him, clutching his son. Patrick stood, dumbfounded, seemingly incapable of recognizing not only the creature, but anything else before him. What do you want? Patrick asked. Innately, he knew the creature wanted something. The creature smiled, licking his lips. Yeah. <laughs> Vine tender fruit, not spoiled by the worms of new, but by the tree that bore it. Ripened not into ambrosia, but a rotten hollow core. Nice. Patrick stared at the creature. Sweat began to collection on his brow. He felt as if his brain itself had been lit afire. He couldn't breathe. I... I can't say I understand, Patrick stammered out. The creature smiled again. Not by love of a dying star can a, a planet be adorned, but by the eruption of its most sacred peaks? That was a question. Weird. Yeah. I desire the treasures from which you hope to find salvation. The gift to your boy. It is a gift for me now. So he wants the PlayStation? The latest video game system. Yeah. Possibly the PS5. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Krampus wants the fucking PS5. Whatever this thing is. Okay. Patrick couldn't understand why the creature would want the game system. But he felt it necessary to give it up. He quickly bolted downstairs, grabbing the box and, clutching it tight, he sprinted back up to his son's room. The creature, upon his arrival, thrust Patrick's son to the floor and held out one long, beckoning hand. As Patrick handed over the present, he couldn't help but feel as if he were Faust himself, exchanging an eternity for one single moment of gratification. The creature licked his lips once more and... <laughs> <laughs> and disappeared in the time it took Patrick to blink. It was one really long blink, considering he was waiting 11 minutes outside for the fucking clock to turn. <laughs> <laughs> when he was sure he was alone, Patrick fell to his knees and wrapped his arms around his son. He expected a, Thank you. And, I love you. Something. He heard nothing. He looked down. He found that his son was withering away, becoming the very shadows that inhabited the night around him. Patrick knew at that moment that he was entirely alone, swallowed, finally, by the chasm beneath his feet. 
He stumbled to the garage before sitting down, embracing his solitude and his communion with the musky smell of paint that seemed to beckon invitingly. That's it. That's the end of that. <laughs> hey, at least it was a Christmas one this time. Wait, so he gave this creature this PS5. His son is withering away, dying. Anyway, yeah. And now he's like, I guess I'll just go to my fucking garage and sniff paint thinner. Yeah, just embrace this loneliness. I mean, realistically, he could have kept the PS5. At least then he could have played the PS5. Right. Yeah, okay. and in my head as well, I had pictured, uh, what was his fucking name? Roger from... Uh, <laughs> from American, American Dad? American Dad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Right. All that right. was... That was delightful. That was called a painted Christmas. That was pointless. They're all pointless. They're creepy pastas. I'd love to read one that creepy was actually pastas. good. Creepy pasta. <laughs> oh, it's pasta. It's creepy. It's creepy pasta. <laughs> Your face when you said that. Creepy pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to edit so much out of this. No. Don't do that. My last one, I actually think is is good. Probably terrible, but out of the three that I've read. All right, so this is my last one. My little pony, apocalypse pony. <laughs> all right. Okay. Do all of you guys... Oh, wait, sorry. This was called Up on the Housetop. Okay. Do all of you guys remember that Christmas song, Up on the Housetop? No. <laughs> Neither do I. The one that was burned into your brains as a kid, constantly chanted as a harmless Christmas carol. Up on the house top, up on the house top. <laughs> Let's just, just do my little pony. Um, I'm just doing my little pony. <laughs> <laughs> weird. Okay, weirdo. Up on the house top, reindeer paws. Out jumps good old Santa Claus. Down through the chimney with lots of toys. All for the little ones. Christmas joys. Ho, ho. Ho, you big ass ho. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Who wouldn't go? Ho, ho, ho. Who wouldn't go? Up on the housetop. Click, click, click. Down through the chimney with good Saint Nick. Oh, I, I know that song. Yeah, now. I actually think, okay. I thought this was like a made up. Okay. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> Keep that part where I'm oh, like, ho, oh, ho, ho, you big old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I do actually remember the song, I think. It's not that harmless. When I was a kid, I was told by a number of my friends that they found Santa Claus to be a bit creepy or even frightening. But I'd always thought otherwise. That is, until I found out that there was never a Santa Claus. But if Saint Nick never existed... Why did our parents tell us about him in the first place? Were they preparing us for heartbreak with such a lie? Or were they just telling us another lie, possibly to protect us? I came up with such a theory when I had a terrible experience of myself. On the Christmas Eve of 2006, I had just turned nine. I was so excited for the morning the next day that I couldn't sleep. I had already found out earlier that year that Santa Claus was a hoax, but that didn't diminish my rabid love for the holiday itself. I was laying in bed, staring up on staring up into the pitch blackness of my bedroom. Usually I slept with the door open because I was scared of both the darkness and separation. This night though was different. My mother had to close the door because she didn't want me sneaking a peek at the presents she had gotten for my older sister and me. So I accepted the darkness just for once, my mind too distracted by the thoughts of tomorrow, to think about what could be lurking in the pitch black that engulfed my room. I was concentrating on my mother's conversation with my grandma, hoping to hear something about what they got me. At the age of nine, Eavesdropping was my expertise, but the sound of gift wrapping and tearing of tape drowned out their voices. That and another faint sound. It was familiar, 
I focused on that sound for a while, trying to figure out what it was, although almost imperceptible. It was a song. A song I knew very well, one that comforted me for a moment. Up on the housetop, click, 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 down through the chimney with good Saint Nick. I hummed along with it. But then I realized something off-putting. Maybe it was my imagination or possibly sound being thrown across the house. Our house does that often, but it sounded like, for whatever reason, this faint music was coming from inside my room. Starting to get scared, as I usually did when I forced into when forced into the darkness, I turned on the lamp on my nightstand. I relaxed to find that nothing was there, aside from my dresser and a pile of clean laundry that I had forgotten to put away. The music also abruptly stopped as I did this. Suddenly I heard another sound. It was a knocking sound, coming from above me. Well, more like footsteps, I realized, as if a bunch of animals were walking around the roof of my house. Reindeer? I was shocked. I thought Santa didn't exist. Yet here it was, the telltale first sign of his arrival. Reindeer on your roof. I heard the music start up again, this time at a slightly louder magnitude. I could hear the words now, sung by an unknown chorus of children. Again, though, it was coming from inside my room. By now, I was intensely confused and equally as frightened. Where is this sound coming from? Why are reindeer on my roof? Am I alone right now? Do mama and grandma hear this? Countless questions flooded my thoughts as I heard the thumping from above me and the music surrounding me. They both stopped abruptly. I listened, tense, to see what would happen. I was frozen, and now clutching the Bible that I kept under my pillow to ward off bad dreams. It was a common exercise that most of my family practiced as we all were raised to be ferociously religious. But the Bible did not help me as I looked in horror at a new sound coming from inside my room, directed inside my closet. I heard my clothes on their hangers start to rustle, and then the doorknob jiggle. I was frozen in fear. None of my body could move, no matter how much my mind screamed. Escape. Escape. Whatever it is, get away from it. The doorknobs turned slowly. The door gradually opened all the way, creaking intimidatingly. I looked into the darkness that was my closet. The only emotion I felt at the moment was pure terror. I saw white eyes stare back at me. They didn't glow. There was nothing especially terrifying about them despite the fact that someone was inside my closet. The music started again, paralyzing me even more, if that was even possible. It was very loud now. I could hear the chorus of children singing the song again, yet they sounded different, shaky, maybe even frightened. Did they feel the same way I did? I saw whoever was in my closet emerge from the darkness into the light of my lamp. I felt tears wetting my face, my throat burning. I felt like I could scream. I wanted to scream. I needed to scream. But he did not allow me to. I don't know how. His silent stare just told me not to. It was Santa Claus. But his face was not sweet cuddly or caring, as depicted in the many pictures and movies about him. He looked at me with a grim look, as if he was extremely upset at me. But that was an understatement. His overly disdainful stare was what was making me cry, not him being inside my room. The music now sounded like it was melting away, fading into the background. It got quieter and quieter until we were both staring at each other in complete silence. 
down through the chimney with good Saint Nick, he said, behind gritted teeth, his voice low and hateful. What? I choked out in reply. I didn't understand. Why was he telling me the lyrics to this song? You, he uttered. Suddenly, he lunged for me, but I jumped back in surprise. I nearly fell off the other side of my bed. Realizing the ability to move again, I sprinted towards the door and threw it open, nearly breaking it down. Santa moved quickly, grabbing hold of the shoulder of my pajama shirt. I pushed the opposite way with all of the force I possibly could in a desperate effort to make him let go. Thankfully, he did, and I ran down the hallway. Mama! I screamed, my voice finally coming back. She whipped around in confusion, sitting on the couch with a hat tape present. I jumped over the couch and hid behind it. Usually, I would never even attempt to jump the couch as I was terribly unathletic, but in this situation, it was the best idea possible. She stood up, a look of both fear and fury washing over her. Grandma sat on the floor next to the Christmas tree in shock. Mama immediately started toward my bedroom. Santa stood motionless in the hallway, that look of disdain on his face. He never moved until Mama charged at him with all her force. She locked her hands around Santa's throat, gripping it with so much force that it seemed impossible. She must have been powered by adrenaline and the motherly instinct to protect us. Santa fell to the ground within a matter of seconds, and it was only then that Mama let go and began kicking him in the stomach repeatedly as she screamed, Bitch! Don't ever touch my kids! <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well done, Mama Bear. She called Santa Claus a bitch. Santa, you little bitch. <laughs> All the while that song was playing so loud it rang throughout the entire house. He began singing along as he coughed up blood, his evil expression never changing no matter how equally evil my mother was to him. Her sudden power and strength was ridiculous and somewhat amusing, yet he remained unchanged, singing along with hate until passing out. My sister opened the door to find Mama still beating Santa senseless, which must have frightened her as much as he did me. Grandma called 911 and was describing an apparent break-in and our address. Soon the police came, long after Mama had determined that he wasn't waking up anytime soon. The music had stopped and just before the sound of police sirens came, we heard the sound of footsteps on the roof again. Later, the police determined that he was just some crazy old guy who had sneaked into the house earlier and had been hanging out in my closet for a while. He was delusional. Either he thought he was actually Santa, or that Santa was just a Scooby-Doo-esque costume that covered up his identity. But that still didn't explain the footsteps on the roof, or that song. I don't think I'll ever know what really happened that night, but Christmas has never been the same for us. And I will never, ever sing that song again. Whoa. <laughs> okay, that was actually good. <laughs> well done. I feel like... Okay, I take it back. That's the first creepypasta I've ever heard that I've gone, holy shit. <laughs> I was invested in that. <laughs> I was like, why is she talking so low? And then I was like, oh, wait. This shit's real. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know how, if I can top that, but... This one is called A Very Special Christmas Supper. The first time you meet your girlfriend's family is extremely important. Maybe they will become your family too. You have to be funny and charming, but not too funny or too charming that it seems unnatural. You don't want to be a faker or a bootlicker. When I was about to meet Mabel's family, I couldn't stop feeling anxious. At 25, I had dated a lot. And I knew she was the woman of my dreams. She was beautiful, successful and sweet. The most supportive and generous person I have ever met in my life. We had been together for a little over two years and I felt so at ease with her. All the time it was like we could be our true selves to each other. Her parents, younger sister and older brother all used to live in another country. So we still didn't get the chance to meet. We talked over Skype and FaceTime a few times and they at least seemed to not dislike me. But you know it's not the same thing. They were already at Mabel's spacious, modern house in the suburbia, 
when I arrived on Christmas Eve. I cursed myself for not being the first one there, but no one seemed to mind. Hi, Jonah! Her father, Richard, opened the door for me, enthusiastically shook my hand, then decided it wasn't enough and half-hugged me, patting me on the back. Such a businessman, don't worry! Maybell has told us you had work, you had to work today. I don't know what country they're from, but this is the accent that I'm going for. That was the feeling you got. Yep. Okay. His warmness both shocked me and relieved me. For a man in his 50s, I assume, he was incredibly handsome. All right, calm down there. Richard had auburn hair, like Mabel, and was tall and fit. He guided me to the other family members in the living room. Martha, Bernie, Fred, this is the famous Jonah. Looks even better in person, am I right? He strongly patted me on the back again. He keeps saying, in the back. <laughs> he strongly <laughs> patted me in the back again. <laughs> Look how good you look in this suit. Martha, <laughs> Mabel's mother, was overjoyed to see me and landed two kisses in my cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> wow. In. She didn't look one day older than 35, and, just like her daughter, she smelled good. After hugging me, she screamed to the general direction of the kitchen, This one is a keeper to Mabe! <laughs> <laughs> this guy sounds like he wants to have, like... A relationship with the whole family? Yeah. Oh, just wait. Next was the little sister. Bernie was around 15, blonde, and with a face that looked carved on white marble like her mother. She rolled her eyes with a smile, a sign that she thought her parents were too much, but in an affectionate way, and extended her hand. Nice to meet you, Jonah. I hope you enjoy yourself today. There's, oh, there's so many fucking people in this. Like, anyway. Last but not least was Fred. He was one of the best-looking men I have ever met. Richard and Martha complimented me, and I know I look all right, but compared to him, I'm more akin to a trash bag. <laughs> Jesus, don't get so down on yourself, Jonah. He was tall and strong, both in the arms and the legs. And the dick. <laughs> His trousers and button-up shirt looked amazing on him, fitting perfectly like he was an Armani model. His hair was shiny and his teeth perfectly aligned. I'm not ashamed to say that if I wasn't exclusively into chicks, I would fall for him. <laughs> sounds like you might be already falling for him, yeah. pal. Yeah. It sounds like you're not exclusively <laughs> into chicks. Maybe you learned something about yourself. <laughs> None of them look this good in video, but I dismissed it as the quality of the frontal camera slash webcam. That explains why they complimented me. I was probably fucking ugly on their calls. <laughs> Please have a seat, son. Richard pointed me to a chair. Mabel will change and we'll be here in a second. I don't know, he's like a fucking gangster. Are they all gonna fuck? I Just wait. Okay. The five of us had agreed... Do you know who I'm thinking? The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Christian Slater, that's who I'm like uh, channeling right now. Yeah. The five of us had agreed. Oh, the five of us had a great time talking, shifting between lots of entertaining topics and getting to know each other better. Yeah, I can see. I can hear the curses later now. <laughs> Every single one of them was interesting, and I honestly couldn't wait for them to become my family. Sure, I love my parents, but they are so normal. Around 20 minutes after I started socializing with them, Mabel came downstairs. She was stunning. Her makeup was perfectly done. Her hair looked like rubies. Her dress was like the wind, and her face was sweeter and prettier than ever. I was truly wonderstruck, and regretted that, for a second after meeting her family, I thought she was the least gorgeous person of her kin. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Never tell her that. Yeah. I couldn't hold back anymore. I got on my knees in reverence, then straightened myself and proposed. I had been carrying the ring in my pocket for a while, waiting to do it sometime shortly after I met her parents. Well, it was a little quicker than expected. 
Everyone in the room erupted in screams of joy. Mabel emphatically said yes a few times and held me tightly. After a few seconds, the others joined us in a hug. It was the perfect Christmas with a perfect family. I'm so glad our family is complete now. Richard's eyes were full of happy tears and he squeezed my face between his hands, then kissed my left cheek. So please let's eat? Bernie asked in a typical impatient teenager tone, but with a note of joy. The tidbits I had earlier were not enough. Sure, sweetie. Jonah, let's go to the dinner table. The boys will get the main dish. Martha guided me to another room. The table was long, filled with side dishes, and perfectly set. Richard and Fred soon entered the dinner room with an immense plate filled with a roasted human. Are you here? Are you, uh, did you hear this? Yeah. They're, human. They're going to eat human. I thought my eyes were deceiving me, but nothing else could have this size and shape. It looks delicious as always, sis. Bernie was happier now than before. Is this, I babbled, a human, Mabel responded like it was the most natural thing in the world, like it was merely a turkey. It actually tastes great roasted, if you know how to adjust the oven temperature. And boy does she know. What the fuck? Fred added with a smile, starting to cut the meat. The seasoning is amazing too. Upon a better look, I noticed the body belonged to a young male. Bernie greedily ate her first bite, and instantly her beauty and youth became uncanny, almost unbearable. It was like she was glowing with an otherworldly light. Come on, son, Richard gave me a fatherly look. We're beautiful, rich, smart, and successful. Who would ever get that without a little ritual here and there? We only need to make it once a year. It's a great cost benefit, Martha remarked as she served herself with potatoes and just one of the feet. When she noticed I was staring at her dish, she explained with a smile, I just love to nibble on the bones. Gross. That is so gross. And it don't have to be a female virgin. This would be so boring and old. As long as the person is young and beautiful, we can make do. This is some frat guy who tried to force himself on my friend, Bernie explained. Well, not on my watch. I don't know what this accent is. I'm sorry to anybody. <laughs> all their explanations made me consider it all extremely reasonable. Don't you love me? Mabel batted her eyelashes, knowing very well I loved her more than anything. Don't you want to become almost perfect like us? We know damn well a couple that performs rituals together stays together, son, Richard said with a charming wink. Me and Martha have been together for 40 years. It's guaranteed. As I made up my mind, I didn't answer. I just cut myself a slice of the leg and decided to partake. Finn. That was it. That was it. Yeah, he ate, he ate a fucking human. He's going to become almost perfect like the rest of the... All right, well. Good for him. I would just like to apologize on behalf of anybody that I have offended today. Yeah, if you eat human, <laughs> we're sorry. Yeah, or if you sound like that, I we just think did. you sound like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Happy fucking Christmas, everybody! Yeah. Happy holidays! Happy whatever. If you're eating human, if you're if you're not eating human, if you're some humanoid that just really wants the PS Five, yeah, and is going around killing children, mm -hmm. just have a good time. And if a friend tries to give you a parrot, just say no, thank you. No fucking thank you. Because you'll only have a week to live. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, if you did listen to all of this, we are extremely grateful. Yeah. Hopefully everybody had fun. Yeah. We certainly did. <laughs> and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side, bitches. Yeah. Let us know if uh, these creepy pastas, if you enjoyed them, because, you know, we can do this more often in the future or whatever. Yeah. Adam will proofread his them beforehand. I did proofread mine before, <laughs> and I thought they were great. Um, yeah, anyway, have a great fucking holidays, all that. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
email us your stories if you happen to have any spooky encounters while you're at home this christmas yeah or just fucking talk to us man just fucking yeah, say whatever. hey just be like hey 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 and then anyway. we'll be like hey <laughs> and then that's it <laughs> yeah uh we had one of our listeners share their uh family mince pie recipes with us the other day yeah that was fucking dope as hell and we're gonna do it yeah we're gonna fucking do it uh it might be a late and we're gonna eat it yeah stephanie thank you very much yeah stephanie big shout with out your to mince you pie with we're your gonna mince make pie. it all right happy christmas everybody again happy holidays bye, bye. oh i didn't do it